In today's episode, we go over some of the most horrifying shark attacks told on the channel so far. From a diver being decapitated by a shark in front of his co-workers on the boat, to a teen being bitten in half while scurfing with his friends, hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most horrifying shark attacks you'll ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. To some, a cruise is a peak of travel comfort and the ultimate experience that everyone should have. With the chance to see the world and bring all of your home comforts along for the ride with karaoke, cocktails, and shows available every day. You are treated like a VIP every minute that you're on board and can easily see some new countries and cultures along the way. It can be the ideal experience, but the problem on a cruise ship is when it comes to safety. While the locals know all the problems and the things to look out for in their town, the constant flow of tourists are oblivious. This can lead to people getting lost, eating the wrong food, or, in the worst cases, death. If there have been sharks in the area recently, the locals won't swim there because they would have heard through word of mouth a luxury that is not afforded to most travelers. Unfortunately, this is what happened to Chris Davies on his tour to Sydney when he came closer to the local wildlife than he ever could have wished. 59-year-old Chris Davies had been enjoying his cruise so far. He had boarded in Melbourne onto the Grand Princess cruise liner with 3,000 other people as they explored the Fiji Islands and headed to New Caledonia, an island off of Australia. He had enjoyed the last nine days immensely, soaking up the sun and relaxation that came with a five-star holiday. He was a very active man, regularly competing in triathlons for years and finding new ways to keep healthy as he headed towards retirement. He had represented Australia several times at World Championship events and was well known in his hometown as a very devoted and determined man. Back home, he had a wife and three children whom he loved dearly, and, although he was enjoying his holiday, he was excited to return home to see them again. Before he was able to travel full-time, he was still working as a software programming consultant in Sydney, a job that took up a great deal of his time, but it made his relaxation time even more precious. He was very excited for his next destination, where he hoped to swim in the clear waters and snorkel along the coral reefs to see what the underwater world would hold for him. Unbeknownst to him, there was much more waiting under those waves than just colorful fish and coral. Once the ship reached the shore, Chris quickly disembarked and went to explore the beaches close to the port. He always enjoyed getting his bearings before he headed off on his adventures. It made him feel much safer rather than aimlessly wandering around. He managed to find a local restaurant where he could try some of the local food and then went to the Chateau Royal Beach with amazing views across the whole bay. As he arrived, the sun was gradually getting lower and there were lots of people taking advantage of the cooler temperature of the evening by swimming in the sea. Chris decided he would join them and have a late swim before he headed back to the boat for dinner. He set his things down and walked out into the water, choosing to stay close to the pontoon as there were more fish for him to see there. He swam around the jetty for a little while, diving down to watch the fish, but remaining close enough to shore that he could still see his things. He was wary of someone stealing his bag as he was in a new area and didn't know what the people were like. He was, however, worrying about the wrong thing. There was nothing on land that would cause him harm. It was the animal that was swimming right towards him that he would never see coming. At 4 p.m., Chris thought about returning to the shore as he was getting tired from his day of traveling. As he was debating his next plan, he was pulled under the waves with a strong grip on his leg. He was dragged further from the shore and he could feel the water getting colder, so he knew that he was somehow in deeper water. The grip on his leg loosened, but he wasn't safe yet. As he surfaced, he looked around for what had just attacked him and saw a four-meter tiger shark charging towards him. 
He put his hands out in front of him in defense, hoping to push the shark away from him or at least provide some kind of protective barrier for the rest of his body. There was no protection to be given. The shark approached quickly and, as Chris tried to push it away, the fish bit off both of his hands in one swift motion. The pain was indescribable, and he screamed out for help as the animal continued to bite and shake him. There was nothing he could have done to defend himself, and now, with blood pouring from his hands and thigh, he began to feel weak and nauseous. The shark pulled him under the waves once again and shook him violently, his blood filling the water and fueling the shark to become even more violent. His screams had attracted attention from the shore, and he could hear them organizing his rescue. But deep down, he knew it would be too late. As he felt the shark bite into his body once again, the pain was minimal as he began to lose consciousness. From the shore, lifeguards heard Chris's screams and knew something was wrong. A shark attack had happened just a couple weeks previous, so they had been on high alert for another, and it seemed today was that day. They ran to their jet skis and charged into the water to where they could see Chris surrounded in blood. He wasn't moving, but they didn't want to pass any judgment on his condition until they pulled him from the water. When they brought him back to shore, a number of civilians swarmed around the scene to administer first aid while they waited for the emergency services to arrive. They were surprised that he was even still alive, but they intended to keep it that way. They were shocked to see the man without any hands, as well as a bite along his thigh that was nearly 40 centimeters long. The idea that they were swimming next to such a massive predator sent shivers down their spines. His blood was still openly flowing from his wounds and soaking deep into the sand. They didn't even think it was possible for a man to bleed so much, but they knew that from the injuries he had just sustained, it was unlikely that he would survive. Even if he did, he would have horrifying disfigurements that would change the rest of his life. He would need help doing regular activities and would most likely never compete as a triathlete again. Even so, they put all of their efforts into saving the man bleeding in front of them, hoping against hope that they would keep him alive. They continued with their CPR efforts for 40 minutes, desperately hoping that they would be able to save him, but unfortunately, it was too late. Chris Davies died from his extensive injuries at around 5 p.m. After Chris's body was collected, an investigation was launched into how this could have happened. The beach was not supposed to have been reopened so soon after the last attack, as they hadn't been able to prove that the beach was safe yet. Sadly for the tourists, they had no idea about this and were not stopped from going into the water, which is why Chris was able to be attacked. Locals also knew that the jetty where he was swimming was popular with sharks, as staff members from the hotel would throw food in for the fish to show their guests. Following the attack, they closed the beach again to ensure that no one would be able to put themselves at risk, and a shark culling was put into effect. Fishermen began their search and managed to catch two sharks that they believe were most likely to be the culprits of the attack. During the necropsy of the animals, one shark was found to have the left and right hands of Chris Davies within its stomach, along with fragments of his swimwear. This proved without a doubt that they had caught the animal responsible, and so they told the public that the killer shark was dead. Upon further inspection, they also believe that the same shark was most likely the one that attacked the woman a few weeks previously, meaning it had gotten a taste for human flesh. Luckily for everyone else who would travel to the beach later, the threat of meeting their final affliction by the jaws of a man-eating shark was gone. What do you like to do when you go to the beach? Do you like to relax on the golden sand? Maybe you like to read a book or go paddling in the sea. Well, for some people, diving is their passion, swimming amongst the different types of marine wildlife and exploring old wrecks that have sunk below the waves can be really exciting, but also really dangerous, as this one man found out in today's story. Manuel Lopez had lived on the coast of Mexico his entire life. He was proud of where he lived and his heritage that came with his place of birth. The 56-year-old man loved his home and wouldn't trade it for the world. However, 
His life wasn't necessarily an easy one, taking advantage of where he lived. Manuel learned from an early age how to dive for the mollusks that lived on the bottom of the ocean floor. His father, who was a fisherman himself, taught Manuel just how important fishing was and how it could earn him a livelihood if it was done right. Manuel took all of his father's teachings to heart and, over the years, he practiced fishing and diving for mollusks until he was able to do both quite expertly. What he really loved was diving into the ocean in search of scallops, mussels, and all sorts of other shellfish. He found the thrill of diving down into the water exciting. He never knew what he might find or what kind of animals he might come across. Of course, as the years went by, Manuel also learned of the dangers that diving for shellfish could bring. Strong riptides could take him out to sea, where he could potentially end up getting lost. Murky waters could also bring danger as Manuel could get lost in the silt and not know which direction to go in in order to get back to safety. But the most dangerous thing of all were the predatory animals that lurked in the water, sharks. Mexico is home to a diverse range of shark species, with nearly 100 different types found in its waters. The Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea are particularly important areas for these animals as they serve as breeding and feeding grounds for many species. There are some species of shark which live on the Mexican coast that are fairly calm and non-aggressive towards humans. These are the whale shark, the largest shark in the world, hence its name, and the nurse shark is also relatively harmless to humans, often dwelling on the bottom of the ocean in shallow waters to hunt for small fish. However, it is the more aggressive sharks that people need to worry about, species such as the bull shark, which are actually responsible for most of the attacks in Mexico, the hammerhead sharks, and the one that many people find the scariest of all, the great white shark. Whilst common media has made them out to be more vindictive than they actually are, considering they are just animals acting on instinct, great whites are still a shark that nobody should mess with as they are incredibly dangerous. However, sometimes circumstances push people to do things that might not necessarily be the wisest decision at the time. This is, unfortunately, what happened to Manuel. It was February 2023, coming into Mexico's springtime, and Manuel and his fellow fishermen were all busy, trying to collect as many mollusks and fish as possible so that they could sell them to local restaurants to earn a wage. However, there had been reports of quite a few sharks migrating into the waters around the coast so that they could hunt for fish and give birth to their young. Because of the number of sharks that were being reported in the area, including great whites, the fishermen, and especially the divers, were warned not to enter the ocean as they could potentially be putting themselves at risk. For a little while, Manuel and his fellow fishermen stayed out of the ocean as they didn't want to risk their lives. In times where people like Manuel can't work, the Mexican government gives out a stipend of 7,200 pesos, which is roughly $400 per year. However, this is not a lot to live off of, especially if the fishermen have a family to support. As the days passed by, there quickly became a shortage of seafood in the area, which meant that demand for the items were at an all-time high. Manuel found himself being drawn to the ocean to go diving for shellfish again, as he knew he could get a good price for his catch, and he needed the money to help support his family. Finally, deciding that he would rather take the risk to try and get a bit more money, Manuel put on his diving suit, a full gray suit, and went diving near San Jose Beach in Tobare Bay. He didn't have any diving equipment, preferring to hold his breath as he dived down to a depth of around 59 feet so that he could collect axe tripe, a mollusk which is like a scallop, from the ocean floor. It was a shellfish which Manuel had collected multiple times before, and he knew where to look to get the best fish. Despite the dangers, things were going well for Manuel for a little while. The diver was collecting the shellfish at quite a fast rate, and he was looking forward to the large amount of money he would hopefully be getting after he had sold all of his catch. Jose Bernal was another fisherman who was out with Manuel at the time. He was diving into the water from the boat that they had brought along and was collecting the mollusks as well. He had decided to get out of the water for a little while so that he could rest. However, Manuel felt that he was finding quite a lot of axe tripe and he didn't want to lose the spot where he was finding all of the shellfish. 
It was whilst Manuel was diving to the ocean floor, though, that something happened that no one could have expected. As he was relaxing on the boat, Jose noticed an odd shape in the water. At first, the fisherman couldn't make out what the shape was, but as it got closer, Jose quickly felt panic taking a hold of him. He knew that the massive shape, which looked to be around 19 feet long, could only possibly be one thing, a shark. After coming to this conclusion, Jose's terror increased tenfold. He had no clue how he was supposed to alert Manuel to the danger, as he was still underwater, and Jose did not want to get back into the water with the dangerous shark nearby. The fisherman could only hope that Manuel wouldn't attract the shark's attention, and that it would simply swim on by, but that wasn't the case. Manuel, not having a clue what was happening or what was coming close to him, was quickly running out of air. Deciding that he needed to go back to the surface for air, Manuel began swimming up, taking his haul with him. However, in just one moment, everything changed for the worse. In one moment, Manuel was swimming happily, and then in the next moment, the massive great white shark came swimming out of the murky water, bursting through the water at 35 miles per hour, and in just one bite, the shark separated Manuel's head and part of his shoulders from his body. Jose had witnessed the entire event, and he could not believe what he had just seen. There was nothing that he could do for Manuel, as he was most certainly not alive anymore. With nothing else to do, Jose returned to the mainland, where he informed the proper authorities about what had happened. But why did the shark go after Manuel? Well, whilst great whites do attack up to five to ten humans every year, they usually only take an experimental bite before moving on, as they are not actually that interested in hunting people. Instead, the great white's usual prey consists of seals, sea lions, dolphins, and turtles. However, every now and then they can get confused due to how people look in the water when they are swimming. Thinking that it was a source of food, the shark will attack the person, which could lead to some very serious injuries or in the worst case scenario, a fatality. This is sadly the most likely thing that happened to Manuel. The fisherman was most likely just unlucky to be in the water at the same time as the massive shark was swimming nearby. And whilst it wasn't necessarily anybody's fault what had happened to Manuel, it is important to remember that the ocean is the home of animals like sharks, and that it is always better to play it safe than to risk a life to dive into the ocean when these incredible creatures are nearby. Sadly, all that could be done for Manuel after the incident was to try and collect the body from the water, and then, once that was done, bury him in a proper grave. Fishermen spotted a shark off the coast of the western Mexico coastal town of Paridan, Colorado, two weeks after Manuel Lopez was attacked and killed by a shark while fishing for mollusks. This shark is thought to be the one responsible for decapitating Manuel. It has been spotted several times since the fatal attack, and authorities have been unable to kill it. This massive, man-eating shark is still on the loose in the waters around Mexico, waiting to bring another innocent diver like Manuel Lopez to their terrifying final affliction. Although there are currently more than 1,000 different shark species, one extinct species has captured the world's attention since its discovery in 1835, the Megalodon. Thought to be nearly 20 meters long, it would have been three times the size of the modern great white shark and would have dominated the seas before it died out 2.6 million years ago. Despite the species never being seen outside of fossilized remains, the prehistoric shark has become somewhat of an urban legend in recent years, as people debate whether it evaded extinction and now lives out at sea somewhere. Most dispel this as a myth. But what happens when a shark is spotted that's as big as a minibus? Although not a megalodon, a creature of that size living in our oceans is a terrifying thought. You might think, surely something like that can't exist outside the realms of the imagination, but you would be wrong, as Lloyd Skinner discovered when he found himself face to face with a dinosaur-esque predator. 37-year-old Lloyd Skinner 
was visiting South Africa for a month after finishing a stretch within a mine in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. After a few hard months underground, rarely seeing the sun and putting his body through hell, he was excited for his holiday. He was planning to be in the country for a month before he headed to the United Kingdom for his next adventure, but he would never make it out of South Africa. On January 12, 2010, Lloyd decided he would spend the day in False Bay at Fishhook, which was home to a small but beautiful bay. Although the waves could be rough and there were a large number of sharks known to be in the area, he decided that today would be the day that he would go swimming. He loved to swim in the warm southern waters and prepared his trunks and goggles so he could make the most of his time in the water. Sadly, those goggles would turn out to be the cause of his savage death. As Lloyd and girlfriend Deborah arrived at the beach, they were disappointed by the weather as it had become colder and cloudier since the morning. Now it was about midday and they had just arrived, but Lloyd was still determined to go swimming, regardless of how the weather would turn out. Deborah decided she would stay on the shore and sunbathe, meaning that Lloyd could safely leave all of his things with her without having to worry. With his mind unburdened, he headed into the water and began to swim out to sea. There were quite a few other people in the water, and he briefly acknowledged them as he passed by, but ultimately wanted to swim alone. He continued to swim until he was about 100 meters from shore, but it was still pretty shallow. He stood in the ocean, with the water coming up to his chest, so he didn't consider himself to be particularly far out to sea. He could see the other swimmers in the distance, but was grateful for the space alone and quickly began to swim back and forth in what felt like his own private pool. After some time, Lloyd noticed his goggles were filling with some water, so he stopped to readjust them. Although the water was only to his chest, he couldn't see the seafloor. The waves were kicking up the sand so much that the water was dark and murky. He thought nothing of it, but little did he know that something was watching his legs from the depths. Lloyd put his goggles back on just in time as he was dragged under the waves. He had been tossed around for a few seconds under the water before he even realized what was happening. He had been attacked by a shark, and now his legs were bleeding profusely. Panicking, he began to shout for help and managed to get the attention of some people on shore as he waved and screamed that a shark had bitten him. There was a mixed reaction from those further into shore. Some began to swim out to his aid, while others swam away in a panic, hoping that if they reached the sand in time, then they wouldn't be the next victim of the massive fish. He felt a wave of relief as he saw his rescuers make their way towards him, but he had underestimated how far out to sea he was and how long it would take for help to arrive. As he tried to swim towards them, he was suddenly pulled underwater again. Lloyd felt sharp teeth sink deep into his abdomen as he screamed in agony. If there was any hope for him before, it was gone now. He turned to face his attacker through his goggles and was shocked at the sheer size of the animal before him. The animal's head dwarfed him, proving to him just how easily the shark could overpower him. The massive animal continued to bite down on his torso and shook him violently determined that Lloyd would be its next meal. His vision was beginning to cloud, both from blood loss and the fact that the ocean was now a deep red color as the shark continued to rip him apart. For just a second, the shark let go of his body and he floated to the surface, barely fighting to keep his head above water to take his last breath. He could hear faint screams from the shore as people spotted his mangled body in the distance and could only imagine the horror that his girlfriend was feeling as she helplessly watched him bleed to death so far out to sea. With one last desperate look to shore, Lloyd was pulled below the water for the last time, where the shark took him far out to sea and devoured the poor man. The witnesses on the beach couldn't believe what they had just seen. One minute, everything was calm and serene, and the next, Blood was pouring into the ocean, and they couldn't seem to figure out why. When they heard Lloyd screaming for help, they realized what had happened and panicked. From the safety of the shoreline, they watched in horror as the shark came back again and again, ripping into the man as he struggled to escape before it finally ripped him apart and dragged him out to sea. 
They were terrified by the size. It was at least 14 feet long, about the size of a minibus, which made Lloyd look like a doll in comparison as he was thrown around by the huge animal. It was a horrifying thing to see, but even as the rescuers got to the scene, they couldn't see any sign of him except for the massive amount of blood that had stained the ocean. They called for the emergency services, who began to search the ocean with four rescue boats and a helicopter, but they knew that there was no hope of finding Lloyd alive, judging from the descriptions that the witnesses had given. They were hopeful that they would be able to at least recover some body parts so that the family would have something to bury, but they couldn't find anything. The shark had devoured the man whole and left nothing behind. The locals began to worry as these shark attacks were becoming more and more common. A shark expert was consulted and they determined that it was most likely a great white shark that had killed Lloyd Skinner due to its massive size and unique hunting style. A large shark had been spotted in the area just a few hours before the attack, but the shark flag was not raised to alert the people on the beach. Everyone on the beach that day continued to swim without any worry at all about sharks. If they had raised the flag when they first saw the shark, maybe this even could have been avoided, but unfortunately, it cost a man his life. There have been lots of discussions since then to figure out how to avoid these attacks, but most have been deemed too impractical or expensive to yield any worthwhile results. Some of these ideas included sonar buoys that could alert the lifeguards to the presence of a shark, or even some talk of an electrified system to send a shock to any approaching sharks before they had the opportunity to get too close. Until a method that will prevent all sharks from entering the waters around the beaches, these brutal attacks will continue. The great white sharks around the coast of South Africa will always be lurking waiting for its next meal, bringing another innocent person to their terrifying final affliction. While Wychinnikup National Park in Western Australia is known to have a particularly magical coastline, the jewel of the area is Shane's Beach. With beautiful white sands and crystal clear waters, the beach attracts many tourists who come to camp and live away from home for a gorgeous holiday. Whether they come to swim, snorkel, sail, or just sunbathe, there is something for everyone to do and enjoy their time off from work. Aside from the people on the beach, there will also be some other visitors that people may need to be aware of, some friendly and some distinctly less so. People flock to see the different large lizard species and the diversity of exotic bird populations, if you're lucky, you might even catch a glimpse of the world's rarest marsupial, Gilbert's Potoroo. It's also not uncommon for swimmers here to come across the great white shark, the most dangerous shark in the world. Jay Muscat learned this firsthand in 2014 when he came face to face with the animal and tragically never escaped. 17-year-old Jay Muscat loved to dive and was an active member of the West Australia Undersea Diving Group with dreams of becoming a commercial fisherman. He would regularly go diving with his friends and family, where he would competitively fish with them. On December 29, 2014, just a few days after spending a happy Christmas with his family, he decided to go diving with his friend Matt Polella near Chains Beach to practice his spearfishing technique. They arrived on the shoreline at 11.30 a.m., ready to see who would catch the most fish. The skies were pretty cloudy, creating dark waters in front of them, but they were undeterred. They knew how to handle themselves in the water. What they didn't know was that something was lurking in the waters, just waiting for someone to break the surface. Sharks were not uncommon, and the diving club regularly warned their members of the smaller bronze whaler sharks that would attempt to steal divers' catches. However, there were very few reports of someone actually getting attacked. The teenagers were both blissfully unaware that two days ago, a great white shark had been sighted, and then, just an hour before their arrival, the same shark had been seen circling the area again. It was searching for something to eat, and the teenagers were just the right size to convince it to initiate an attack. 
Upon arrival, the boys entered the water pretty quickly and began diving about 40 meters away from shore. They took some time to assess their surroundings and then began their hunt, hoping to settle the argument of who would be the better spear hunter. They were happily swimming around for about 20 minutes when the unthinkable happened. Matt felt something smack into him with intense force, so much so that he believed that he had somehow been hit by a boat. He was instantly disoriented by the sudden hit and immediately surfaced to figure out what had happened. Looking around to understand what happened, he suddenly spotted Jay flailing in the water with a five meter great white shark attached to his leg, the most fearsome predator in the ocean. It dwarfed the teenagers with its massive body and sheer strength. They knew they wouldn't have a chance against such a massive beast. Blood began to surround them as it poured from Jay's leg, and he began to kick the animal in the face with his free leg in an attempt to escape. Aside from fighting off the shark, he also needed to make sure he could keep his head above water, or else his efforts would be for nothing and he would drown. The pain was unlike anything he had felt before and the more he fought, the more he felt himself weaken. He knew from the amount of blood surrounding him that the shark had hit a major artery or vein and that he was bleeding out quickly. He knew he didn't have much time and continued to kick the predator that was determined to kill him. Tragically, he quickly realized that he wouldn't be making it out of the water that day as he stopped fighting and everything went dark around him. Matt was helpless to do anything but watch as his friend slowly lost consciousness while the shark continued to thrash and tear at his leg. The water was now thick with blood, which caused Matt to become confused as to where the shark even was, but he soon found out. As the shark realized that its first prey was dead, it turned its attention to Matt and began to charge at him. Through the red cloudiness of the water, he could see a set of sharp teeth swimming directly at him and knew he only had about 10 seconds to save himself. He finally remembered that he was holding a spear gun and aimed it at the shark. He knew that he would only have one shot and had to make sure it was a good one. His life depended on it. Remembering the advice that he had received so many times about how to defend against a shark, he aimed straight for the shark's nostril. He watched as the spear sailed through the water and smashed into the animal's mouth instead. It began thrashing in agony as soon as the spear was embedded into its body, giving Matt a short period to escape. He spotted some rocks about 30 meters away and knew that they were his only hope. He began to swim for his life. He had never swum so fast before, knowing that if he stopped for even a second, then it was unlikely that he would ever escape the waters again. He allowed himself one glance to see how far away the shark was, but luckily it was still thrashing around in pain and blood was pouring from its mouth. He prayed that the animal was dying, not only to save himself, but also as a punishment for killing his friend. He immediately continued his escape, not wanting to waste any more time in the water. After an agonizing swim, Matt made it to the rocks and pulled himself out of the water. He could see where his friend had died and the blood that was staining the water. His friend's body was floating on the surface now, only being moved by the waves and the thrashing of the shark beneath it. Although he was happy to be safe, he just wished the same was true for his friend, whom he was unable to save. He began to search for nearby boats that would be able to take him back to shore and eventually flagged down a passing fishing boat. He explained what had happened and they were all rightly appalled by the incident. They agreed to collect Jay's body from the water and began to make their way over to him cautiously in case the shark was still nearby. They kept an eye out for the shark but couldn't see it and so quickly retrieved Jay's body from the water. It was then that they saw the extent of the ordeal that Jay had been through. The shark had ripped through his leg, tearing the femoral artery and causing unstoppable bleeding. It is thought that due to this blood loss, Jay then went into hypovolemic shock and his internal organs quickly stopped working. They were devastated at the sight of this poor teenager who had so much of his life ahead of him killed in such a brutal way. After they returned Jay's body to shore and returned him to his family, 
a manhunt began to find the shark responsible. The beach was immediately closed out of respect for the deceased, but also for the safety of everyone visiting. The last thing they wanted was another death on their hands. The Department of Fisheries dropped drum lines for a week following the attack in the waters of Chains Beach and the surrounding areas in an attempt to catch the creature. There were patrols sent out in the area to find the animal and told that it would most likely still have the spear embedded in its skin, a clear marker that this would be the animal that killed Jay Muscat. They were hopeful that the body would simply wash up on the shore, and as time went on with no further shark sightings, they began to believe that the shark may have actually died from its injuries caused by Matt's spear gun. The hunt for the shark caused controversy across Australia, with some believing that the shark was simply acting as a natural predator and should not be harmed when humans are the ones invading their homes. Others believe that it was the same as putting down a dangerous dog. Once it attacks a human, it will most likely attack again. Ultimately, the animal was never seen again after extensive searching, so it was decided that it had been fatally wounded during the attack and had either sank to the bottom of the ocean or had become a meal for another animal. We will never know what happened to the shark responsible, but we will always remember what it did to Jay Muscat before he met his final affliction. In 1993, John Doyle was surfing off the remote coast of Angola, West Africa. Unfortunately, he was attacked by a shark and had to get out of the water immediately. Injured and defenseless, John was subsequently attacked by a pride of lions. When wild animals attack humans frequently, there is a reason that can be pointed to. In such cases, People can often be blamed for unwittingly entering an animal's territory or ignoring the easily noticeable warning signs that are especially obvious in hindsight. In other cases, people's negligence gets in the way, carelessly forgetting how to respond correctly in a dangerous animal encounter, like using a canister of bear spray. However, in this particular peculiar case, hindsight does not help at all. Everything in today's episode can simply be attributed to terrible luck. The sun was out and about illuminating the dew-drenched tree leaves in Angola, West Africa in the fall of 1993. John Doyle woke up to the early morning sunrise, pushed aside his curtains, and took a gander at the weather outside. John excitedly got up from his bed. After all, the wet and humid climate of the fall season made things difficult for everyone the heavy downpour of the past couple days prevented any outdoor activities. The bright sunlight was a welcoming sight for John. John had been itching to surf for days, and today looked like the perfect opportunity. The Denver, Colorado native went to his kitchen to prepare breakfast, pressing the coffee maker and prompting its first brew. After breakfast, John went out into the driveway and strapped his surfboard to the roof of his 1973 Land Rover. He checked his surfing essentials and decided it was time to go. He drove for a while, listening to music in his car. Although experienced surfers like John know the risks of venturing into shark-infested waters, the excitement of hitting a big wave was worth the risk. John never thought anything would actually happen to him. Arriving at the beach, John parked his car by the edge of the road overlooking the ocean. He took a whiff of the salty air and breathed in the ocean view. Spotting the waves from afar, John stretched for a while, warming up to an exciting surf session. Entering the warm waters, he paddled out into the open. He floated on the surface and sat on the surfboard, waiting for the right moment. When the wind arrived, John positioned himself on his stomach, head parallel to the stringer and toes pointing toward the surfboard's tail. He paddled slowly and then quickly, carefully watching the incoming waves from his peripheral vision. With the waves arriving to meet him, John pushed himself against the board. Just like that, John was surfing the waves. For a few seconds of bliss, he forgot where he was. However, when the wave eventually caught up to him, John was thrashed underwater. In his attempt to regain composure and position, John accidentally cut his right foot heel with a coral reef. Experience dictated to him that even a small cut was to be taken seriously, but it shouldn't be an ultimatum. 
He continued surfing till the morning gave way to the afternoon. Paddling on the calmer surface of the waters, John was thinking about other things, completely entranced by the ocean and the brightly burning afternoon sun. Suddenly, a chaotic movement from the corner of his eye caught John's attention. Approximately 20 meters from his position, he noticed some thrashing fins, indicating the presence of sharks. Wary of his cut, John immediately resorted to his training and decided to get out of the water. He noticed a wave forming and paddled his way toward it, gaining position to send himself inshore. Like he had rehearsed a thousand times already, John prepped to lift himself up to his feet, catching the wave that would take him all the way to shore. In his panic, as the creature approached him, John fumbled on his feet and was thrown off his surfboard. As he regained composure, John swam toward his board frantically. However, he never reached it in time. Suddenly, John felt a searing pain in his right calf muscle. The shark attached itself to his leg, a massive great white shark. The water burst into chaos as John panicked and moaned in pain. However, despite the immense ordeal, he managed to remember his training. John reached down toward the creature and clocked the shark in the nose, forcing it to release its toothy grip. John scrambled onto his board and readied himself for the next incoming wave. However, he lay powerless, wallowing in the foamy white waves, unable to stand on his board. Suddenly, the shark attacked him again, this time from the side. John writhed in pain from the creature's bite, causing him to scream. Unfortunately, he was alone, and nobody could help him. Thinking on his feet, John had to make a difficult decision. He rolled off into the waters and used the tail end of his surfboard to defend himself against the marauding beast, jamming it into its mouth. The surfboard folded like paper as the now frenzied creature bit into it. John immediately jumped on the remaining half, still afloat, and was able to get into the next wave. Fortunately, this was enough to deter the creature, and John got away with his life. He crawled toward the beach and assessed the situation. His heart was beating fast as he looked over to his right leg. It was broken, bleeding, and mangled beyond belief. Still alone, John crawled and stumbled toward his Land Rover, parked near the main road. He grabbed some clothes from the passenger seat and quickly wrapped his severely injured leg. He desperately needed medical help, but it was an hour's drive away. Unbeknownst to him, John's ordeal wasn't over yet. Inside the car, John urgently started the engine and made his way toward the main road. He writhed in pain as he forced himself to use his injured leg to drive. He stopped for a bit to regain composure, took a few deep breaths, and decided to just wing it. John was no pushover, and his mental strength to remain calm in this situation was a sight to behold. For a few minutes, John drove away, still writhing in pain from the injury. However, as he got farther, John became more and more dehydrated. A few hours ago, he celebrated the 35 degrees Celsius heat, but now it turned against him. After a few more minutes, John's head began to ache. He couldn't take it anymore. He stopped at a nearby creek along the way and got out of his Land Rover. He laid down on a rock by the creek's edge and drank. He wanted to get out as fast as possible, but the searing pain in his right leg was now too much to bear. He had to rest. As he lay motionless on the rock's surface, an ominous beast was lurking in the background. A male lion attacked him suddenly. It had been stalking him since he took a step out of his vehicle. It bit its massive jaws on John's torso, tearing his flesh like a hot knife through butter. Despite the agonizing pain, John felt a surge of anger in his chest. After all, John was injured, but he certainly wasn't defenseless. He grabbed a stick nearby and ferociously defended himself against the ravaging beast. He poked at its eyes and nose and whacked it as powerfully as he could. The male lion backed up and retreated. However, the situation turned worse as John noticed a pack of lions waiting for him from afar. Operating on pure adrenaline, John propped himself up and dragged his injured body into the vehicle. Just as he was halfway inside the vehicle, the pack suddenly attacked him. They probably understood he was getting away. John's arms and legs were bitten countless times by the marauding lions. He screamed in pain, but nobody could hear him. Eventually, after fighting against the beasts with all his might, 
John somehow managed to enclose himself in the safety of his vehicle. Unfortunately, his body had now become so mangled he was unable to drive the vehicle. Under the searing heat, John sat in his vehicle, hoping the lions would go away, and they eventually did. John was left to deal with the worst enemy of all, time. With all the injuries he sustained throughout the day, John was running on fumes. Unable to drive himself to the hospital, all he could do was wait. Fortunately, after 30 minutes, a group of tourists passed by his vehicle and noticed the blood and chaos on the ground around the car. They peeked inside the vehicle and saw John bleeding profusely from his injuries. They immediately rushed him to the hospital. John was promptly treated and received 250 stitches. According to experts who examined the shark bites, the creature was at least three meters in length. Miraculously, John recovered completely and was able to live a full life again with his wife Janice. He resides today in California. Although he still serves to this day, Janice doesn't allow him to go alone. Even though he did everything right, John was still a victim of these attacks for apparently no reason. Whether you call him lucky to be alive or unlucky to be attacked by a shark and a pride of lions on the same day, John proved himself to be a hardy man. If this happened to anyone else, they would have almost certainly met their terrifying final affliction. Great Whites are truly terrifying creatures and are considered by many to be the undisputed apex predators of the open waters. Naturally, they are regarded as some of the best hunters in the animal kingdom, thanks in large part to their ability to detect blood from up to five kilometers away. Their torpedo-shaped bodies also give them the speed and power they need to swim up to 57 kilometers per hour, which they use to quickly ambush and take down unsuspecting prey with surprising force. Adult great white sharks have a lifespan of 30 years, a maximum length of around 20 feet, and can weigh up to 6,600 pounds on average. The largest recorded great white is thought to be 7 meters, 23 feet, weighing 2.5 tons. Great whites also sport razor-sharp teeth that can grow up to 6.6 .6 inches tall. They are known to be opportunistic predators, which means they take advantage of whatever opportunity for food comes their way. Their diet consists of anything from the ocean's surface all the way down to the sea floor. And as great whites grow in size, so does the range and type of prey they go after. Smaller great whites will typically eat fish, rays, and crustaceans. But when they get larger, their diet also starts to include creatures like seals, sea lions, dolphins, seabirds, humans, and even other sharks. Nick Peterson, aged 18, was with three friends 300 meters from shore at West Beach, South Australia. The sky was clear and cloudless, a perfect day for scurfing. Scurfing is a water sport that combines the best of both worlds, the excitement of skiing with the freedom of surfing. Nick and his friends, Ty Wheeler, Adam Floriani, and Andrew Tomlin, all teenagers from Adelaide's western suburbs, had been swimming for half an hour and taking turns on the surfboards. As they were enjoying themselves, little did they know that a full-grown great white, almost six meters tall, with a viciousness to match its size, was stalking the group from afar, likely studying them, trying to find the easiest target, and patiently waiting for an opportunity to strike. Large white sharks were a common sight in the area where Nick and his friends were enjoying their hobby. Almost three weeks prior to the incident, two men in a boat were nudged by a five-meter white shark as they fished 10 kilometers off the shore of St. Kilda, north of Adelaide. The next day, a shark of the same size terrorized fishermen off North Haven before making swimmers scramble for safety at Tennyson, Henley Beach, and Glenelg beaches. In addition, on December 2nd, a shark was seen far out in Gulf St. Vincent. Gary Biddle from the Grange Surf Life Saving Club said he saw a white shark swim under his boat while offshore at Grange the previous weekend. In the hours leading up to this tragedy, Lenka Merzlikova, a tourist from the Czech Republic, 
unknowingly witnessed something truly terrifying. It was the sight of an enormous black dorsal fin 30 meters away from the shore she had caught a glimpse of while looking out to sea. At first glance, she thought it might be a dolphin and decided to do little more than take a picture. As one of his friends was getting back onto their boat, Nick gleefully jumped into the water. That was when disaster struck. As soon as Nick's body touched the water, he was caught off guard by a gaping maw lined with razor-sharp teeth, lunging at him with unfathomable force after emerging from underneath the waters. The array of sharp teeth sank deep beneath Nick's flesh, grabbing him by the left shoulder and viciously shaking him around in an attempt to tear off large chunks of his body. Nick was writhing in pain, and his friends made the hopeless effort of trying to rescue him by hitting the water with their paddles, but it was too late. The vicious shark would circle around and then submerge with Nick still in its jaws numerous times before submerging one final time. Nick was gone for a second at this point, but before his friends could even process what had just happened, Nick resurfaced, and as soon as his friends shifted their gaze toward him, they were all mortified beyond words by what they saw. It was Nick, now floating face down, motionlessly, and with his lower half completely gone. Nick's body drifted amidst an unholy pool of blood, tissue, and half-torn organs. Immediately after the attack, Nick's mates raced south to the Adelaide Shores boat ramp. Minutes later, one of the teenagers ran up the beach in tears, shouting to swimmers to get out of the water. Later on, it was rumored that another smaller 14.5-foot great white was briefly glimpsed feeding on the vestiges. This took place while hundreds of people were present at the shoreline, and after a meticulous beach and sea search, the only found remnants of Nick Peterson were two small pieces of one of his lungs. Out of all the tissues in the human body, Researchers have found that samples belonging to one's lungs are the only ones that may escape being consumed during fatal shark attacks. This is because pulmonary tissue is full of air, making it buoyant and causing it to rise quickly to the surface. If someone dies from the attack itself rather than by drowning, this phenomenon enables rescuers to determine what exactly transpired in cases where no witnesses are present. One of Nick's friends, Ty Wheeler, remembers that fateful day perfectly. I was watching Andrew in the water while Nick was driving, and we saw dolphins, he said. We turned the boat around and it was just so magical, so we decided to drive closer to them. It is theorized that one of the so-called dolphins they saw was, in fact, Nick's would-be assailant. In what must have been a difficult and traumatizing retelling of the horrible events which had transpired, Ty recalls that the shark struck so quickly that the teens barely had time to react. Nick's body was literally torn in half within seconds, and then a second smaller shark moved in to feed on the remains. Over time, the water near the beach became red with blood and filled with unrecognizable body parts, some of which even washed ashore in what must have been quite a disturbing sight for anyone present. The only thing that was found during the later search were some pieces of Nick's lung. South Australian Sea Rescue Squadron spokesman Fraser Bell stated, the shark tore him in half and the other shark came in and took the rest. When asked if there was any chance Nick may have survived, Bell's shocking reply was simply, none whatsoever. The police shut down several beaches in the area soon after the attack was reported. They began searching by air and sea at 3.30 p.m sending patrols along the beach to warn people about what had happened. As previously stated, it was thought that the two white sharks had carried out the attack together. These sharks were reported to be approximately 4.5 meters and 5 meters long, respectively. However, further investigation showed that only a single 5 to 6 meter white shark was involved in the attack. Local experts said that it was likely the same shark that had been seen near Adelaide beaches in previous weeks. Although white sharks are a protected species in Australia, officials still held a meeting on December 18th and decided that the specific shark responsible must be found and killed. On that very same day, Nick's parents, Philip and Leonie Peterson, 
were interviewed at West Beach. They stated, we don't advocate the indiscriminate killing of any shark. They are to be admired, appreciated, and respected. And Nick knew that, said Philip Peterson. Unsurprisingly, two of Nick's friends had to undergo therapy due to the devastating trauma they went through, a trauma that may never fully heal or depart from their memories. Nevertheless, the tragic story of Nick Peterson is a reminder that sharks are a part of the natural environment. It is important to respect their natural instincts to seek food and not disturb them. Always remember that even though shark attacks are rare, nothing in this world is certain. Both tragedy and fortune are likely outcomes when spinning the wheel of fate, and no one should ever feel too comfortable in shark territory, especially if they are not familiar with the area. It is crucial to always be aware of your surroundings and take caution when swimming in an area where these majestic animals are known to roam, because if you don't, you may find yourself little more than a formless mass of flesh and bone drifting atop the crimson red waters with your last thoughts being of your final affliction.